Poverty is the norm, wealth the exception. With us today, a man who has written a book to remind us of that fact. Dr. Thomas Sowell on Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Thomas Sowell has taught economics, intellectual history, and social policy at institutions such as Cornell, UCLA, and Amherst. The author of more than a dozen books, well over a dozen books. Dr. Sowell is now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. His latest work, Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, an International Perspective. Tom Sowell, welcome. Good being here. The big idea. Wealth, poverty, and politics, quote, the difference between seeing economic disparities as due to differences in the production of wealth and seeing those disparities as due to the transfer of wealth from some people to other people is fundamental. Explain that. Well, I think there are a lot of people who, who regard uh, so-called disparities and in, uh, inequities in income uh, as something that requires some great uh, explanation seem to assume that uh, in the absence of some intervention, everyone would have something roughly equal uh, income. Uh, virtually everything that goes into the production of income varies enormously between groups, between nations, uh, between people on the, on the flatlands and the people in the mountains. You name it, it varies. It varies. And I take it, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but as I was reading this, I take it as one of the principal efforts of this book mm to correct the thinking of Americans who have grown up, most of us, in conditions that by the standards of human history and by the standards of many other places on the globe today mm. would be conditions of almost staggering wealth. Yes. Even poor people in this country have smartphones, televisions, cars, and so forth. And we tend to assume, it may be human nature, we tend mm. to assume that our conditions are normal and conditions that differ from ours are the anomaly. And, yeah. and, and this book says, no, 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 no. Well, good heavens, and especially if you look back through time, uh, really it's, all, it's only within the last five or 10% of the existence of human beings that there has been agriculture. I mean, think what that means, that people had to f feed themselves hunting, hunting and gathering, uh, fishing, herding animals. But, and, and of course, that meant that you couldn't have cities. Because uh, you, for all those other ways of living, you need an enormous amount of land per person. Right. Uh, if you were to, uh, one Manhattan would probably be enough, you know, to spread, spread famine throughout the world. Uh, so that I guess start with geography because that's the most uh, implacable uh, uh, obstacle, and uh, geography is nowhere anywhere close to being normal. For example, just geographic uh, phenomena uh, in the uh, the great majority of all the tornadoes in the entire world occur in the middle of the United States. You don't hear about tornadoes in London or Paris or Beijing. Uh, and you don't hear about them in New York or San Francisco, for that matter. That just in one little place in the world, all the conditions are there for a tornado alley. Uh, and it's true with so many other things. Nothing is evenly spread out. The, 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 there are rivers on every continent, but the rivers aren't the same. Uh, let me add, I was especially struck. Let me give you, this, here's a quotation from the book. Western Europe's rivers often lead out into open seas, providing access to seaports around the world. But most rivers in Eastern and Southern Europe are quite different. Yes. W what's the difference and what, what well, bearing has that, that, had, that had on economic development? Well, the, 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 the uh, rivers in Eastern Europe tend to flow uh, into, into lakes and, and inland seas. And so when you, when you get to the end of the Danube or the Don, you are not out in the open ocean. Uh, you know, you're, 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 you're in the Black Sea or the yeah, Caspian. Ca that's whatever. right. And then if you want to get to the Atlantic, you have to go to the entire length of the Mediterranean to get out there. Uh, the rivers in Russia, most of those empty into the Arctic Ocean, which is not quite as convenient as the Atlantic or the Pacific. Uh, and what that means is that you can't have the commerce, uh, you can't have industry and whatnot, to the same extent that you have. More importantly, you are not connected with the rest of the human race to the same extent. And one of the, one of the major findings I, uh, throughout the book is that isolation almost invariably means poverty and backwardness. 
in the mountains, yes. if you live in Eastern Europe or Russia and you're cut off from the rest of the world, isolation leads, in fact, well, we'll get to this in a moment, but mm. it, it seems even to have an effect on cognitive ability, prolonged isolation. Oh, sure. Well, certainly in terms of not just sheer knowledge, you don't have the same knowledge, but more than that, you're not aware of what, how the basic things of life are done differently in other parts of the world. And so people who are isolated will keep doing things for centuries or thousands of years. So, that, for example, when, uh, when, when the British landed in Australia, uh, they find the, the Australian Aborigines are living really a, at a Stone Age level. Similarly, when uh, people from Europe uh, uh, got, came to the Canary Islands, the same thing. They, they, they had no idea of, of iron. Uh, in Australia, they, they had no idea of iron. It's one of the great sources of iron ore in the world. Staying with geography for a moment, mm. again, one of the themes that seems to me to run through the book is this question of <clears throat> your resistance to notions of, to, to attempting to pose, to impose notions of morality on economic conditions. So, for example, with geography, some people happen to be born in Western Europe, where mm. the rivers lead to the sea, mm. and some people happen to be born in Russia, where some rivers lead to the frozen Arctic and some rivers lead to the Black Sea, mm. and it's nobody's fault. Yes, it's luck. Yes, or, or 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 sheer happenstance. Nobody's robbing anybody else. Yes, as, as, as one economic historian said, said, you know, the world has never been a level playing field. All right. Cultural factors, another one of the large segments of the book. Let me quote to you again, wealth, poverty, and politics, quote, without the cultural prerequisites for developing natural resources into real wealth, the raw physical resources themselves are of little or no value, close quote. Tell us what you mean by cultural prerequisites. Partly, that would be simply the uh, knowledge of how to use things. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the book, uh, the main difference between us and the caveman is simply human capital. Don't forget the caveman had all the, all the natural resources we have today, and he had them in greater abundance because none of them had ever been used up. But, but he didn't have what, the, the knowledge that it would take to turn those to his own purposes. We just know more. Yeah. We just know more. Now, you note that you note a certain productive capacity that certain cultural groups demonstrate. Mm. And you can see them because they demonstrate the, certain, the same, let's call it industriousness, mm. as they disperse to different parts of the world. Yes. Germans, mm. Chinese, Lebanese, Jews, Indians, quote, the productivity is a matter of culture. That productivity is a matter of culture is shown by how many groups have arrived in various countries far poorer than the existing population and have nevertheless risen above the economic level of those who were there before them, close quote. Mm -hmm. Let's just choose, uh, let's, you name a lot of groups, it's a big book, let me just give you, <laughs> toss one at you and see how you do. The Overseas Chinese. Oh my goodness, the Overseas Chinese uh, settled largely in Southeast Asia. Many of them came there with little more than the, than the clothes on their backs. Uh, there was one uh, Chinese millionaire in one, in one of the countries who had in the, in the, the, the foyer to his uh, mansion this uh, stick with a, with a little uh, cloth thing tied to it because he, he walked into, in, into this place with that stick, all his belongings and this little cloth thing tied to his thing, stick over his shoulder and he took off from there. All right, uh, the Jews. Oh my heaven, that's been in so many places. Uh, my gosh, the, the, the Lower East Side of New York, one of the most terrible places when the Jews landed, uh, the, the uh, poverty and uh, uh, squalor is just unbelievable. Uh, in fact, even as late as, when, as uh, the, the 19, uh, late 1940s, when I went to school on the Lower East Side, I had always heard that, that all Jews were rich. And when I saw the Lower East Side, I said, like, why are these rich people living like this? <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 the buildings on the Lower East Side were older and in worse conditions than the buildings in Harlem where I lived. And they don't live there anymore? No. Those I, neighborhoods have turned over? Yes. Uh, and it went, went by generation. The generation that was there first, 
uh, even when they rose up to where they could have moved, they didn't because many of them uh, were, were not fluent in English and so on. Right. And so you could live on the Lower East Side knowing only Yiddish right. and find doctors, uh, lawyers, anything you wanted, you going to stores and so forth. Uh, and, and if you moved up to uh, upscale places like Harlem, which was once Jewish, or, the, or to the Bronx, which at another time it became Jewish, uh, you, you would lose that. The, the more acculturated people, the next generation who spoke English and were more familiar with American society, they lived in those kinds of places. Got it. So why is it that in many instances that you detail, you get a, a, a subgroup, the Chinese moved to Fiji. Mm -hmm. And why is it then that so often we see the pattern that not that the indigenous, the people who were there first, mm -hmm. failed to get with the program. And in, to the contrary, not only do they not get with the program, learning the skills of productivity, they tend again and again and again to persecute mm -hmm. the groups that came with nothing but achieve a certain level of affluence. So we have the Jews, that's an old story, ancient yeah. story, the persecution of the Jews. But you also show it with the overseas Chinese and Malaysia, mm -hmm. with Indians in uh, East Africa, and on and on it goes. What's going on there? Well, for one thing, there's no, there's no particular reason to have expected the indigenous people to have acquired the same skills that the people who came there had. Uh, and worse yet, the leaders of these groups are very quick to blame the fact that they are lagging on the other groups who are more advanced. Uh, one of the phrases that you often hear that this group took over this whole industry. And in many cases, there was no such industry until they came there and built it. Right. They did not take it over. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> so those are industry, those are examples of the way culture can promote or enable economic productivity. You also provide a counterexample, the Soviet Union. Mm. Quote, the Soviet Union was almost a tailor-made refutation of geographic determinism. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Oh, the, the, the Soviet Union was one of the most uh, richly supplied uh, countries with natural resources and probably the most richly supplied. supplied. Um, it was the only industrial nation which has so much petroleum that they export oil. Right. right. They have some, I don't remember, don't remember the, fat, the fraction, but they have a substantial part of the world's supply of natural gas, which they are now supplying all over Europe. Um, iron ore, manganese, you name it, they had it. At one time, uh, something like half the, the industrial diamonds in the world came from the Soviet Union. Uh, the, the land was so rich that when, when Hitler had sent his army in to invade the, the, the Soviet Union during World War II, he had plans to have the railroads take back this land uh, from, from Russia into Germany because it, it was that well known for its uh, You mean just the topsoil? He was going to yes, say yes, box yes. cars of topsoil That's back right. Germany? That's right. I didn't know that. It, it's one of the most fertile sections of the... And the irony is one of the world's great famines occurred in the Soviet Union. How come? Mismanagement by the government. And Milton Friedman once said that if, if, the, if the government took over the Sahara Desert, there would be a shortage of sand. And the and, and Soviet Union, it, it, was, it was just that way. All right. More on social factors. I'm quoting again from Wealth, Poverty, and Politics. This is tricky ground. There is empirical evidence against, against genetic determinism. We're talking about IQ scores now. Mm -hmm. For example, there have been whole communities of whites from isolated mountain regions in America whose average IQs have been similar to or lower than the average IQs of black Americans. But while such evidence undermines genetic determinism, that does not make mental test differences irrelevant. So we're not genetically determined, mm -hmm. but disparities among ethnic and racial groups are still worth noting, still consequential. How do we put this? No, no, it, it, What's it, the it, you're, you're seldom hiring a whole group uh, or, or, or admitting a whole group to college. What you're doing is, is, is judging individuals. Uh, and the predictive validity is really a totally separate question from the question of genetics versus environment. See, in other words, if the IQ test uh, does not have a single question about flying an airplane and you give it to people who want to become pilots, the only real question is, do the scores on those tests correlate with the subsequent performance of people in the air? Right. 
But you see, I mean, it, it's, it sounds so simple when you say it that way. But the Supreme Court of the United States had a totally different take that the employer must validate uh, a test uh, that, is, that is not job related. And so what they're saying is, it's a question of whether this test seems plausible to third parties who have neither expertise nor experience on the job. And that would be the criterion for whether it's a good test. Right. Staying on this subject of genetics, race, ethnic groups, and so forth, you talk, again, in Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, you describe three very selective, they're public high schools in mm -hmm. New York, but they're very selective. You mm -hmm. have to test to get into them. Mm -hmm. That's Stuyvesant High, your Stuyvesant High, mm -hmm. Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech. Quote, the triumph of egalitarian principles and demographic diversity in the rest of New York's educational system has not resulted in an increase in the number or proportion of black or Hispanic students passing the admissions tests to get into Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech. On the contrary, the numbers and proportions of black and Hispanic students have declined substantially over the years at all three institutions." Close quote. Mm -hmm. So, telegram to Mayor de Blasio. <laughs> As diversity becomes championed in mm -hmm. the city of New York over the last 40 years, 50 years, mm -hmm. diversity actually diminishes at these very selective high schools. Why? Well, it's that the diversity really doesn't do anything for you. Uh, there are many cultural... Doesn't do anything for you as a society? Or, I'm, I'm sorry. I as a society or, or, or the people in whose interest you're, you're promoting diversity. In other words, when black Hispanic kids go to, to schools other than those three, they get a load of diversity. Uh, it doesn't do them any good. For example, as of about uh, 2012 or 2014, I forget the exact one, the percentage of blacks at Stuyvesant High School was one-tenth of what it was 33 years earlier. So it's been a major retrogression. And so while they're being, taught, being their heads full of uh, diversity, the Asian students are learning math and science. Plus, uh, the, the, the schools are also, uh, uh, another point against diversity is that in years past, those schools were so heavily Jewish that Stuyvesant was referred to once as a, uh, a, what is it, a, free, a free prep school for Jews. Well, they weren't diverse, but it was very successful. And now Asian Americans outnumber whites by more than two to one in all three of those schools. It's still not diverse, but they're turning out people who do marvelous things. And that's what they're there for, to benefit the society, not to present this tableau that will please a handful of people. Got it. All right. Political factors, this is the last of the large factors you discuss in wealth, poverty, and politics. Quote, black Americans, a group often identified as beneficiaries of the welfare state in America, made considerable economic progress in the 20th century. Fine, of course, but much if not most. This is the thing with you, the dependent clause is where the sting is. <laughs> but much if not most of this progress was prior to the massive expansion of the American welfare state. Close quote. That is so counter, I want to say counterintuitive because we hear so much about African American progress since civil rights and the, the establishment of the welfare state that it really has become a kind of American intuition. Explain yourself, Dr. Sowell. Well, as of 1940, 87% of black households were in poverty. Over the next 20 years, that declined to 47%. This is all prior to the civil rights laws prior to the social welfare policies of the Johnson administration. Over the next 20 years, it fell an additional 18 points. But that, that was not, that, that was just the same trend continuing at a reduced rate. Uh, affirmative action is even worse because as I remember, the, oh, I'm trying to think now, the numbers, I think it was something like, uh, Poverty rate was something like 30% among black households before affirmative action. And a decade after affirmative action, it was 29%. This is not the same as the 40% decline that occurred before there were any civil rights laws and before there was any social welfare state. And so what happened between 1940 and 1960 was the post-Second World War economic boom. 
It was Is that, that right? but, but it was that, but it was also the massive uh, migration of blacks out of the South. So they're it's, getting better education but, and, and jobs. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> now you mention cultural and social retrogressions. Mm. Again, I'm quoting you. Arguably, the most consequential of these was the decline in two-parent families. Yes. Close quote. Explain that one. Among African Americans. Yes. We're still talking about African Americans. Well, you know, when, when, when they talk about things like this, they talk about the legacy of slavery. Right, right. And, 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 uh, and I argue, well, empirically, it's not that. It's the legacy of the welfare state. Because as of 1960, which is almost 100 years after slavery has ended, uh, the majority of black kids were being raised in two-parent households. But within one generation after the welfare state, that had dropped down to a minority. So that the majority of black kids today are, are, are raised in one-parent households. When you think about it, I mean, uh, centuries of slavery, and generations of Jim Crow did not destroy the black family. But one, one generation of the welfare state did. The Moynihan Report, uh, what was it, a, a call for national action? Yes. The, the, Negro, the Negro family, a call for national action, yes. 1965, and right. even 50 years ago. And his principal point of alarm, and again, now I'm trying to recall the statistics, but I believe the out-of-wedlock birth rate among African Americans in 1965 mm -hmm. was 25%. Something like that, yeah. And he was so alarmed that he wrote this report, mm -hmm. and today it's over 70%. And yes. by the way, the, the rate among whites is over one-third at this stage. Yes. So how do these, how does the family breakdown fit into an economic understanding? Is it something, it's, the, the social breakdown of the American family is something that we have to understand aside from the tools of economics? It just doesn't fit into supply and well, demand well, curve, well, well, curve well, so, economic this history? Is, this occurred at a time when the black income was rising. And so we're saying that previous generations of blacks with lower income and more racial barriers, stuck to, the family stuck together under those conditions. And under the new conditions, which were advertised to make for great progress, in fact created retrogressions. And I think many people who were gung-ho for the idea that this was going to be progress simply cannot bring themselves to look at the evidence and say, my God, we made things worse. You close the book with a chapter entitled Implications and Prospects. Quote, the all too familiar cliche about the paradox of poverty in an affluent society. We're going from international comparisons to this country now. Mm -hmm. The paradox of poverty in an affluent society is a paradox only to those who start with one, a preconception of an egalitarian world in defiance of history, and two, a disregard of the arbitrary nature of the government-defined word poverty. Now, we've already discussed point one. Mm. You've already established that, historically speaking, poverty is the norm, mm. and there's nothing like egalitarianism. It's spotty, particular economic progress is, is surprising in mm. some ways. Number two, the arbitrary nature of the government-defined word poverty. What do you mean by that? I mean that what, what we define as poverty today, well, there was a, there's a Latin American scholar, a scholar of Latin America, he, he's not a Latin American himself, was saying that what we define as poverty here is the upper middle class in Mexico. Uh, most American families in poverty as defined by the statisticians in Washington. And that's the thing I try to bring out. Regardless of what we think of when we think of poverty, what it really means is whatever those statisticians say it means. And, it, and, and that includes uh, the great majority of people who are in poverty in the United States by that definition. Uh, they have microwave ovens. They have, they have central air conditioning. I mean, I was in my 40s before I had a window air conditioner. You know, uh, uh, but the idea of central air conditioning. Uh, most own an automo uh, 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 one motor vehicle or more, and 14% own two or more motor vehicles. Uh, Th this they have is simply, it is simply not poverty, not by any historical understanding no. whatsoever. Yeah, no. Uh, the, uh, in, the, in the old days, particularly thinking about the Lower East Side when the Jews lived there, you know, that the, uh, the, pop, the, the people were squeezed together in these tiny places uh, uh, today, the average American in poverty 
has more space per person than the average European. Not the average poor European, the average European, period. And so all those things by which we've spoken of poverty in the past, those things have long since gone. But the other part of the story is that that doesn't mean they've got it made. On the contrary, they have catastrophic problems because the same mindset that has created the welfare state, the same non-judgmental philosophy has also led to a great deal of leniency toward criminals. And so you have runaway crime and people are living in fear. I'm sure that when I was growing up that we, we never had any, any of the stuff that uh, uh, people in, on, on welfare have today. Uh, but, you know, uh, I could you, speak... Hold on, let's just test that. You grew up, as I recall, late adolescence to high school, you were in Harlem. Yes. Television in the house? Oh, my God, no. Radio? Had, we, thought we, we thought we were a big deal. We had radio. Uh, car? Oh, my, the, the thought never crossed my mind. Uh, when you were a little boy going to school, how many pairs of trousers did you have? I don't know. I okay. only wore one at a time, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't getting J. Crew or L.L. Bean catalogs. Oh, the mail. they were not. They, they must have overlooked me somehow. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't in the right zip code. What about, what about, uh, well, I mean, let me, you weren't hungry, though. You were still well fed, yes. right? Yes, but, but, you know, you mentioned about L.L. Bean. My sister was visiting me from, from uh, the East Coast once and said, you know, the people in the ghetto would not write, wear the kind of khakis you wear. I said, what's, what's wrong? I got these are dockers and what, what's wrong? No, they want designer uh, uh, things. I hear about the, the uh, uh, tennis shoes that are bought there. I mean, I wouldn't pay that kind of money for regular shoes. You know, you know, uh, 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 Did you have enough money for books in the house? No, I, but fortunately I lived across the street from a public library. Uh, but but other but other than that, uh, I I don't know if I ever bought a book when I was growing up. Newspapers though. Newspapers. Uh, By the way, was it considered? Oh dear, how do I say this? There's a place in your book where you talk about cultural the, the retrogression, cultural retrogression against uh, among African Americans, and certain kinds of behavior. Called like, acting white. Acting white. Was it acting white in your day to go across the street to the library? Nobody ever said it. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry, I, but you said you, you didn't have any of the things that supposedly poor people have today. You were making mm -hmm. a point, and then I jumped in and started. But 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 of course, uh, I, 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 I had a sense of security that you simply cannot have. And if you look particularly at the public housing, uh, uh, your neighborhood project, was safe. That's what you mean. Just yes. Okay. I mean, I, I, I can remember more than once waking up at midnight and deciding I will go out and buy a, a newspaper to see how the baseball, the baseball scores are. And so, uh, uh, and, the, and the guy who was, uh, who was selling them was a very small uh, elderly white man uh, uh, down, down at the end of the block. Okay. Today, both of us would be taken into custody and sent in for <coughs> middle observation for being out there in the middle of the night. So poverty in America today is not material want. It no. simply is not by the standards of all time, yeah. all history, yeah. other places, yeah. it is not material want. It's poverty of the mind. It's poverty of policy. It's, it's quality of squalor of behavior. And how does that get corrected? Thus far, it hasn't been. Uh, one of the real problems, and this, this is not peculiar to the United States or to any group in America, <coughs> uh, ethnic leaders, particularly leaders of groups that are lagging, are a major obstacle to advancement because their self-interest uh, is in keeping their group isolated. And, they, and, and, and isolation has been tied in with poverty for all kinds of groups in all kinds of settings around the world. Al Sharpton versus Ben Carson. Yes. Al Sharpton is, is bad for African Americans. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? But un yes, but unfortunately, Al, the Al Sharpton types uh, have, have been the, the rule rather than the exception for groups around the world. Back, back in uh, 19th century uh, Bohemia, uh, where the Germans, again, for a whole lot of... Uh, How do you know all this? Because of my research assistant. <laughs> all right, go, I'll go ahead. 19th century Bohemia. Uh, the Germans had, had all kinds of advantages that came out of history, which you could go into if you felt like it. Uh, but, for example... If you were in, er in, the first, in the early 19th century Bohemia and you wanted to uh, go to high school and, uh, and, and you were a Czech, you would have to learn German because there were no high schools in the Czech language until 1848. 
And so, uh, but that was a condition common throughout Eastern Europe, that the Slavic languages became literate centuries after the German language did. And therefore, there was a huge buildup of knowledge in the German language that was not equally available in Slavic languages at that time. And so if anyone who wanted to become an educated person and go into the professions, they had to learn German. Now, you would think that the, then that the uh, leaders, if they were looking out for the best interests of their followers, would say, for heaven's sake, learn German and move on up. No, they, would have, they, would, they fought tooth and nail against it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sowell and his critics, <clears throat> from a review of wealth, poverty, and politics in the Washington Post. Now, I'm going to just, I don't want you to swing at me, <laughs> all right? Sowell does manage to score a clean hit on those who now complain that income inequality is too high by noting their refusal to say what level of inequality they would consider acceptable. Fair enough. What we also learn in this book, however, is that there is apparently no level of inequality of income or opportunity that Thomas Sowell would consider <laughs> unacceptable, close quote. And you reply? Well, it, 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 it's, it's hard to know where to begin when someone misses the whole point of the whole book. <laughs> uh, of course, you, the, the big confusion among the redistributionists is between opportunity and outcomes. And one of the examples I used in a recent column was, that, you know, when I, when I was a, a kid, I briefly tried to play basketball. And uh, I mean, I was lucky to hit the backboard, never mind the basket, you know. <laughs> but I had ex just as much opportunity to play basketball as Michael Jordan had. You cannot measure opportunity by outcomes. And that's what the redistributionists insist on doing. They say this group obviously didn't, uh, didn't have equal opportunity because they were turned down for loans more so than that group. Yes, if you have lower credit scores, you'll be turned down for loans more so than people with high credit scores. Okay. Thomas, you just mentioned a column. Let's, let's, let's turn to the, the politics of the day for a moment. Thomas Sowell on Donald Trump, quote, what is remarkable is that after six years of repeated disasters under a glib egomaniac in the White House, so many potential voters are turning to another glib egomaniac to be his successor, close quote. Oh, come on, aren't you being a little hard on both Barack Obama and Donald Trump? No, I, th I thought I was pulling my punches. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump is simply not suited to be president? I think that that's true as an understatement. <laughs> All right. Barack Nor is the current president. I was going to say, Barack Obama is the president. Yes. Glib ego mean, how bad has he been? Who, wh where does Barack Obama rank in your mind, you who know so much history, among the worst American presidents? He has displaced Jimmy Carter from that position. The worst? The worst. Worse than James Buchanan? Yes. Worse than Richard Nixon? Yes. All right. Richard Nixon did not, after all, put us in danger of, of nuclear attacks, probably within the lifetime of people living today. The Iran deal will do that? Yes. Right. We're, we're, we're committed to stopping the Israelis from stopping the Iranians from getting a nuclear weapon. That's part of the deal. When I interviewed George Gilder about six or seven months ago, George Gilder known to both of us, he contended that with the right policies, the economy, coming back to the international scene in a moment, but the economy would actually turn around quite quickly. The American economy can be revived quite quickly, cut taxes, peel back regulation, and you'd see another version of the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yes. All we have to do is get out of the way in a certain sense. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, there was, there was uh, when, when Warren Harding took office in 1921, the uh, unemployment rate was around 12 percent. Warren Harding did absolutely nothing. As the, as the uh, government's revenue fell because of the, uh, of the, the uh, downturn, he cut government spending. Now, but, now, both those things are things that the, drive the Keynesians crazy. Right. The following year, unemployment had fallen to about half that level. Within a year? Yes. And then a year after that, it fell yet again. Uh, you know, there is a history. Uh, it, it, the first time the federal government intervened in the economy to get us out of a, of a uh, downturn was in 1930. Now, which means that for more than 150 years, 
The federal government just stood by and twiddled their thumbs while the economy recovered on its own. And all that time, there was never a depression as bad as the 1930s depression, where there was all kinds of, of intervention beginning with Herbert Hoover helping help us, uh, and then amplified by Franklin D. Roosevelt. So in terms of you looking at the, what happened as a matter of fact, uh, again, there was, no, there was no Federal Reserve prior to 1914. Uh, the Federal Reserve was created in order to, one, cut back, cut back on bank failures, uh, reduce uh, inflation, and prevent deflation. All of those things reached historic highs never seen before under the Federal Reserve. So uh, the, 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 the idea was wonderful. It's only the reality that didn't cooperate. <laughs> oh, Tom, I, I'm only laughing because otherwise I'd cry. The international scene. You've just said that under the right policies, the economy could recover quickly. Mm -hmm. Under the right policies, how quickly could, how quickly could, let's just posit that you become president. Mm. Uh, how quickly does the international damage done by your favorite Barack Obama, how quickly could that be recouped? How quickly could the United oh States and the world God. recover? That, that, that's a tough one because whoever comes in there, he's got to face the damage that has been done and the further damage that has already been set in motion. And uh, you know, you don't, one of the reasons we won the Gulf War with far fewer casualties than anyone ever expected, the first Gulf War, first one, right. uh, is that Ronald Reagan bequeathed to George Bush 41 a huge military establishment so that you could send all this stuff in there and just wipe out the uh, opposing army. Whoever inherits this situation is going to be one where it's just the opposite where we've had reductions in the armed forces, we've had cutbacks in all kinds of research and so on, and training. So what, 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 what the next president has to, op uh, to, to operate with is going to be uh, just a very desperate situation. Where does Tom Sowell stand on immigration? I guess there's no such thing as, as, uh, as a policy toward immigrants because there's no such thing as just an immigrant. There are immigrants from different places, different kinds of immigrants, and we don't even want to discuss any of those things. You know, 100 years ago, they were talking about immigration. They had all kinds of data on crime rates, death rates, everything you can think of about immigrants from various countries around the world. We have no one even dares to ask such questions today. So the country in the old days had the self-confidence to pick and choose. Oh, absolutely. We'll take some from here, but not from there. Yes. And that's what you'd like to see. Yes. And what would be the principles? We would accept immigrants who would do us economic good? Economic good and, and presumably, uh, preferably not, uh, not, not, not plant explosives in various places. <laughs> I'm with you. Okay. That's the minimum, the minimum hurdle. Single family, uh, single parent family, the mm. family breakdown. Is that, is that reversible? If it's the result of the welfare state, if we were somehow or other to get rid of the welfare state, would the family, in effect, heal itself? Or is it one of those social it, constructs that once unraveled takes generations to put back it would together? Take, it would take time, but even the modest uh, welfare reform under the Clinton administration led to uh, 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 pe more people actually going to work uh, once the gravy train wasn't there. So that, too... All right, all right. All these things are all these things are achievable. Yes. All we have to do is stop doing the wrong thing. Yes. We have to stop being stupid. Well, uh, you could put it that way. All right. A couple of last questions. We're taping this the week before Pope Francis visits the United States. Pope Francis, in a 2013 statement, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories, oh. which assume that economic growth, oh. encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude, oh, oh, oh. Expresses a crude and naive trust. Will you please stop interrupting? This is the pontiff. <laughs> a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power oh, and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. Close quote. Is there anything you'd like to say to the pontiff? <laughs> I would say, read my monograph on trickle-down theory. Uh, there is no such theory. It, 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 there, there, 
some years ago in one of my columns, I defied anybody to name any economist of any school of thought outside of an insane asylum who had ever advanced that theory. I pointed out that uh, Joseph Schumpeter's 1,260-page book on the history of economic analysis, printed in very small letters, you know, has no mention of any trickle-down. There is no such theory. It's a straw man that's been created, and it's pathetic that someone in the position of the Pope would, would, would spout off about this. I, I, I would say to him what, what I would say to anyone else. You show me that theory, and, I, and, and, and you know, I, I'll, I'll give you $1,000 uh, down payment on toward, toward some law. What about, what about his more? general suspicion toward capitalism as some way of, uh, oppressive? Well, again, if he, if he has any facts, I'd be delighted to hear them. All right. It, you know, what, what, is, what is so frustrating to me is that we've gotten away from facts and evidence. Not, some time back, someone pr uh, did a paper disproving something I said in 1970. Now, no one likes to be uh, uh, found wrong. I was, I was actually pleased with it. It was one of the few times someone has come up with any facts to even bring into the argument. Got it. Last question. <clears throat> As I said, you, you titled the last section of this book, Implications and Prospects. No, I titled it Epilogue. Epilogue, excuse me. You titled the penultimate section. I'm showing off. That means next to last, of course. <laughs> the penultimate section is Implications and Prospects. So, question about the prospect for the American experiment. We hear a great deal about the United States' current condition as a new normal. Mm. Sluggish growth. High unemployment, high unemployment in this, the, un the unemployment rate per se is now down to a, a little over 5%. But if you take into account people who've dropped out of the yes. workforce, difficult to say for certain, mm -hmm. but it's still very, very high, mm -hmm. possibly even in double digits still. Lowest labor force participation rate since 1977. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. And we have this general sense that the United States is losing ground or ceding ground internationally. Mm. That's the new normal. Mm. To paraphrase Ronald Reagan, four years from now, will the country be better off? It depends on what they, what they decide next, next November. So you don't have some kind of underlying faith in American democracy. I you, think, I think any, anyone who has watched the uh, so-called debates would, uh, would find it hard to have much faith. All right, now. But you, you mentioned 1977. Things were terrible then. Note how quickly they turned around when Reagan uh, took office. For example, Iran released our hostages within hours of Reagan's inauguration. Okay. Thank you, because I like to end shows on an optimistic note, Tom. <laughs> you just gave me one. Thomas Sowell, author of Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge on the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.